another Conference USA slate against the defending champs of Marshall. Doc Holliday's Thundering Herd look to maintain their elite status as the best team in Conference USA. The climb to the top starts now. Old Dominion and Marshall next on ASN. Once again, welcome you to Jones C. Edwards Stadium here in Huntington, West Virginia, where as here, really not much different than anywhere else, it seems like, up and down the East Coast. Rain, obviously, will be an issue. Uh, a lot of venues across college football here this weekend. Temperatures in the 50s, rain continues to fall, and for Marshall, Doc Holliday, Mike, you and I had a chance to sit down and yeah. talk with him a lot last night. Terrific guy, very experienced. He's coached in 23 bowl games, and obviously they love having him back here in Huntington. Yeah, a lot. He said a lot to us last night, and one thing that really stuck in my mind was just building a championship culture, and he's just done that. Uh, try to go ahead and come out and score first. Bentley looking to pass on second down. Slings it out to the left side. Again, Blair Roberts and David Washington. Two of the starting wide receivers out for ODU. Again, the give to Lowry and nowhere to go. Maybe a pickup of a yard. And that will quickly bring up fourth down here for Old Dominion. Right now as a young freshman, and he's going to put this team on his back and try to lead them possibly back to another Conference USA championship. Handoff on first down. Okay, you'll check. Coach Holiday said he has it. It factor. Whatever it is, he has it. Devontae Allen slips a tackle inside ODU territory. Out of bounds at the 46-yard line. Linton, six foot six, about 210 pounds. Looking to pass on second down, and it is complete to cross the middle all the way down to the 25 yard line. North and south, and that attributes to a lot of his success last week. I see Marshall's been successful on about a third of their third down conversions, and successful here as they go right back up the middle. They're getting the message loud and clear. Tyler Williams will punt it away. Really good kicker here for Marshall. Marquise Little back deep. Trying to get a return here for ODU. Signals for the fair catch, then lets it go. It takes a bounce in favor of Marshall, and they will down it at the five. What a kick by Tyler Williams. Yeah, but you look at last year's Conference USA Special Teams Player of the Week. He just shows you why. Put it up deep. Another one of the experienced seniors you could see right away. Put that backspin on it. Checks up perfectly. Going to be another tough place for the offense to start here for ODU coming up next. So he can carry the load of this team, but he's going to have to have some help, not only up front from the offensive line, but especially on the outside with the wide receivers. Bentley with a handoff, and Lowry runs right into his line. He gets back to the line of scrimmage, Lowry. and that'll be it. And ODU lost both their tight ends at the start of the season. Blair Roberts is out today. He was in a car accident. He's fine. Just a minor injury. Jonathan Duhall <laughs> And a big hit. Ball is loose inside the 10. A good pressure off the edge. The left side of the defense line. And Marshall's got it. It'll be herd football inside the 10. Coming from the right of your screen. You see the left defensive end. Gary Thompson, number 59. Just really get past number 78. You see from the bottom of the screen, 59. Just do a little bit of disengaging and also causing a Bumble. So Marshall now first and goal with the chance to get the first score of the game. Litton to pass across the middle and it is caught. Touchdown. So the herd strike first. Deontay McManus, the sophomore. Deontay's first touchdown of the year. And I love to see offenses go right after the defense, especially after getting a turnover. He's going to see Litton survey the field and sit comfortably in the pocket. Nothing more than just a skinny post. To McManus to get his first touchdown of the season. Add just a little bit more to the playbook. It doesn't have to be so simplified. I mean, you want to really get a chance to show off your quarterback skill set. Zach Pascal on the return. Trying to get something sparked here for ODU, but right away he is dragged down. Back to work out of the shotgun now for the Monarchs. Old Dominion trying to snap a two game losing streak. Throw across the middle, and it is oh, what intercepted. What a play by Corey Tyndale. Tyndale. Really jumping in front of the wide receiver, undercutting that route. And Bentley had the wide receiver. He had what he wanted. But Tyndale did a really good job of jumping in front of the wide receiver. You just want to go to the left of your screen. Tyndale had Lee Pascal open. And when there's an opportunity to make a guy miss in the open field, he does just that. 
Again, good solid blocking up front by the offensive line, especially number 85, Juracek, really springing Pittman for some extra yards. Last night, I got a chance to talk with Bill Legg, offensive coordinator. Remember, I asked him, I said, you know, with Devin. Four wide receiver set, which has been the same all season long here for ODU. And they had a man open down to the 35 yard line. Play but incomplete. The ball was tipped, I believe, by the inside linebacker. To tie up this ball game. Quick handoff to Lowry, and again, not able to find a whole lot of room on that right side. So you really just go off the tight end or even maybe the wide receivers to see how many on the other side. Bentley again under pressure, wrapped up and thrown down. And the sack by Ryan B. Richard freshman out of Ohio. Yeah, Ryan B was one of those guys that Doc Holliday said that came in last week against Kent State and did some good things with a really good rush and came up the field again. Third down and six. So you see Linton's numbers so far on the day. Has a man open complete out to Deontay McManus again, all the way out to the 34-yard line. Linton again to throw, and again able to find an opening over the left hash mark. And this time he finds DeAndre Reeves. Yeah, not sure if that was communication bust on the back end by the Monarchs defense, but DeAndre Reeves is running wide open down the middle of the scene. Just go to the left side of the field. And you're just going to see Reeves come, come wide open. I thought I slipped out of his hand for the last second, but he hung on to it the whole way. And now on third down, trying to convert. Chased out of the pocket again, steps up. Nice throw, complete across the middle to Devontae Allen. When you talk about the again, showing some veteran like presence. Was moved off the spot a little bit. Was able to reestablish the launch point and then throw a strike down the field to Devontae Allen again. Some pressure coming up the middle. On the edge. And just found a wide open. We can live with the shorter passes just as long as it's not a turnover. Handoff to Pittman finds a hole. And inside the five, spins down near the goal line and just shy. This one's right inside the side of the screen. Good blocking up front. And Philante Fisher just got his hand on the face mask at the very end of that. Lynn gives it to Pittman, walks in easy. Touchdown, Marshall. Yeah, from the defensive perspective, it's not too much you can really do except for trying to blitz everybody to try to get Pittman before he gets started. But I mean, just really good offensive line play up front by Marshall. Really a good surge on the left side of that line, too, by number 67, Gene Phyllis. Since 2013. First time didn't work, second time was stopped. Third time, definitely the charm. Marshall now with a 14 to nothing lead. Much needed pass completion and first down for the Monarchs offense. Pascal, the leading receiver in receptions coming into today, and now another sack back behind the line. And once again for Marshall, it's going to be in Ryan B. Another one of those quarterbacks in Marshall history that you talked about earlier, Jeff. Michael Payton. Michael, the ceremony, how did that feel when you were out on the field big acknowledged? I mean, it felt great. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, a lot of special memories here at the university. And I've got my one of my receivers, Troy Brown, got inducted to the Hall of Fame in 2010, I believe. And uh, Jim Donovan went in 2009. So I'm very happy to be a part of that That. Train. <laughs> the National Football Foundation Hall of Fame obviously means a lot, but to be standing alongside Coach Lingle again, what was that like? That was phenomenal. Uh, you know, I had talked to Jack on the phone a couple of times, but had had a chance to meet him. And uh, I just want to thank him for actually bringing the team back on the field after the plane crash. And it was funny because I was just upstairs and I saw a Red Dawson, and that brought back a lot of fond memories also. Last night, Doc said to us that there is no team or program that means more to its fan base than Marshall because of the history. Would you agree with that and why? I would agree with 110 percent. Because of the plane crash, you know, in 1970, uh, because of the plane crash, uh, the, the community is built around the team. And when the young Thunder and Hurry took the field back in 1970, uh, 71 actually, uh, I think it just brought back the continuity of Marshall football. And over a period of years, slowly we came back into prominence, you know, ending with the 1992 National Championship. And since then, there's been so many additional championships and uh, ball game wins and stuff like that. And I think in the 1990s, uh, Marshall University was the winningest college football team. So uh, I'd have to say 
the community wraps themselves around the ball players. I mean, even to this day, I've been out of college for 23 years now from Marshall University, and I still get welcomed back here as if I'm still playing. So. Indeed, Michael. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations on your honor. We'll go back upstairs see you guys in the booth. Four wide receiver sets. Passes over to the left side, and it is complete. Nice catch as Allen able to just stay in bounds, and he'll end up being about three yards shy of the first down. This one of those old pro throws by Litton. Deep out to the right side of the screen. A pretty good separation, too, by Deontay Allen. Litton fakes the handoff. Wide open to your check. First down, down to the 40-yard line. That was a really good play call, too. I, I believe everybody in the stadium was expecting some form of run, but then you sneak out one of your better athletic tight ends and your check out to the flat, uncovered. You see it at the top of the screen. You know, he just got behind Davila. He just got behind Davila and got onto the flat. That's an old K4 pass to where you sneak a fullback, you know, coming out of the CAA or FCS Independence. Now to the Conference USA, but yeah, FIU's tough, and then Western Kentucky, they just put up a lot of points. That one almost intercepted. Corey Tyndall right there, he's been terrific on defense today. Yeah, look at that pass interference call that he got versus Pascal. Just look at all the way through. He's just going to go to, to the right side of your screen. And he actually did a good job of. Bentley on third and ten. Feels a little bit of pressure Sorry. and dropped from behind. And Tavis Rowe. All this kinds of pressure. Yep, yeah, from the top of your screen, number Marshall, seven, Marshall. Tavis Rowe. Coming from his quarterback position on the in middle line of scrimmage. Gave a nasty Earlier today, Michael Payton, a renowned alumni of the Marshall Football Program, was honored for his National Football Foundation election into the Hall of Fame. He and his family were out on the field. Earlier this year, though, I had an opportunity to sit down with him at his home in Harrisburg to talk about the legacy that he's left behind here at Marshall. For the national championship, Willie Merrick in his first field goal try ever. 22 yards. Yeah! <laughs> Can you believe it? I just remember running in the locker room and I sat down in my locker and uh, I just started crying. Yeah, it was just very overwhelming at that time uh, to finally realize that we had actually won the championship game. So, and a lot of other guys, you know, I remember Phil Ratliff was in there and, and Mike Bartram. Um, I think Troy was in there too, and we just—I mean—we were just hugging each other. It was a very emotional time. Then it's safe to say that that '92 squad is very much still a brotherhood. Yes, you very guys, much so. You guys still keep in touch. Yeah, we all still keep in touch with each other. Laugh and joke in the. Absolutely, <laughs> it's always a good time. You know, it was funny because we had a—it was a really good core group of guys. Mm -hmm. Everybody's personalities, everything just clicked. Even the families. I mean, we could all just hang out. Didn't matter where you were from, black, white, Spanish. It didn't matter. You know, you could be from Georgia, Tennessee, California, you know, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It didn't matter. Just collectively as a unit, it was just a very good core group of guys and families. You get the news that you're going into the National Football Foundation's College Hall of Fame. What went through your mind? I thought about my team and all the guys that helped uh, make me a better player. I thought about the coaching staff uh, that entrusted in me, the Marshall football team, uh, through the early part of the 90s. I thought about my dad and how he instrumented me when I was a young guy coming up and teaching me dedication, hard work, how to stay with things, uh, my mom's love and selflessness uh, that she taught me as kids. A lot of different things. It was very overwhelming. You have mentioned your dad a ton. Mm -hmm. um, you said at one point he kind of had to talk you off the ledge when a little bit of adversity hit yes. while you were at Marshall. Yep. Would you consider him one of your biggest influences? Yeah, my dad and my mom were my biggest influences without question. Um, you know, my dad was a tough guy. I went to work, you know, every day, uh, made sure that my brother and I had everything we needed. Um, you know, they always talk about the roof over your head, food on the table and lights on, daddy's doing what he needs to be doing. And my mom was so instrumental with being the rock of the family, just keeping everybody together solid. And like I said, she was the other side. She was a love, perseverance, and selflessness. And I think I got a great combination of both of them.
Three years ago, before she passed, Peyton's mom told her son he needed to share his gifts, which is how he landed here at the Ark. When you walk into the Ark, mm -hmm. those kids require so much energy. But when you leave, are you like, this is what really matters? The awards are nice, but these are the things that I find most fulfilling now. They are. They are. Uh, getting an opportunity to sit down and talk with the kids and mentoring kids that uh, have never had somebody in their life, especially a male role model. And I think that's one of the problems with uh, America these days is there's not enough men that are taking the responsibility and stepping up and, for one, being fathers to their own children, and two, being able to, to take a young man by the hand or a young lady by the hand and show them the right way to do things. Um, it's very fulfilling because when the kids come, you know, they're a little rough. And what we do is we try to mold them a little bit, shine them up a little bit, and send them out there in an effort to, when they get on the outside, they'll be able to sustain themselves and be successful young men in the community. But where you are now, I mean, right. now you're, you're coaching this mm -hmm. young team, you're working in this incredible facility. Mm -hmm. Perspective on it all? The athleticness that I had and all the awards that I win and have won, that's great, but I want to be known as a, a, a great man, you know, um, a great father, uh, a great person, a great coach, mentor, uh, whatever is needed for uh, myself, my son, uh, my family, and, you know, like the kids that I work for now. Now, let me tell you something else that's kind of scary. In 1970, when that plane crashed, all of us seniors that were on that championship were all born. And we kind of look, wow. it was almost like the death and the rebirth. Wow. Nobody's ever really thought about that. Still four yards to go here for the first down. Bentley again looking to pass. Knocked down at the line. And fourth down coming up now for Old Dominion. And it was by middle linebackers on the team, Evan McKelvey. It's Marquise Little is back. And fields it at the 34, another fumble. Kicked, ball still loose. Inside the 10 and out of bounds. Second down and two, Bentley in trouble and sacks by Devontre Tyler. Tyler did a good job. He gets by on the quarterback, Bentley, in that instance. See the center of your screen, number 51. He's coming kind of on a delayed blitz, confusing Bentley, messing up his count. It's down in the state of Florida, bringing a lot of those kids up to Marshall. And, you know, it's interesting what he said about, you know, hey, if you're really passionate about football, I can fix everything else. And I thought that was a pretty profound statement that he made. Whitney able to get out of a lot of trouble, finds you're a check free. And that's just that uncanny ability that we talked about with it. Where he's scrambling himself out of trouble. He's under duress, obviously, in the pocket, but he keeps his eyes down the field. And then you see Juracek found a wide open in the zone. Six foot six, 210 pounds, and somehow escapes. Yeah, he escapes Wiggins' tackle, kind of just weaving his way through, just trying to find an opening. He was thinking about running. But then, with his eyes being down the field, he was able to get a nice completion to Juracek. Whitten just look to his left. He's got a couple receivers out there. Instead throws to the right. It's Juracek and in for the touchdown. Excellent velocity. For hitting the needle between a couple of defenders. You know, for ODU and Juracek. Again, his third touchdown of the season. You know, just kind of going to the right of the screen. You're going to see 85 with the end man on the line of scrimmage. He's going to run his route up the field and just reappear right in the middle. We can see and fit that ball in between. It could be a nice clean pocket for Litton. Not really rushed, but look at the zip off that ball. Just going right into Juracek. Put it in between three defenders. Again, yeah, really not under the rest. It just fired it in, just took a chance. Actually, Carter had a chance at it. Number 10, the safety, had a chance to break up and get the ball, but good concentration by Juracek. They actually had quite a few injuries in this one, so over on that ODU side, Flante Mishra, that's a Big loss. He is a huge hitter in that secondary. He didn't know exactly what happened to him. You know, when he made contact with Pittman down there on the goal line. Bentley almost has it intercepted twice. McKelvey. 
He had the or actually, I'm sorry, check. Taquan Lang had, yeah. had a first opportunity on it, and the yeah. tip was almost intercepted, too. Yeah, yeah, top of your screen. He read that ball perfectly. I mean, he had a chance to get his third interception. As a freshman here at Marshall. Handoff to Pittman. First down inside the 45-yard line. As you mentioned back in that first half, Mike, it takes a lot of pressure off you as a freshman when you got a running back like that guy. Yeah, I mean, you turn around. I mean, you look at the... Anytime you have your bag up playing, you don't want to have a drop-off in production. This is a good look at this inside zone play. Good blocking up front. And then also, two Pittman just sticking his foot and being decisive while he's running the ball and getting downhill. But it gives you a lot more options with your playbook when you can consistently get positive yards as opposed to you know having a negative play here and there and, and setting your offense behind. And again, a credit to the offensive coordinator, Bill Legg. This is exactly what he wanted to do. And this is their, their game plan to a T. Yeah. I mean, he said, we'll take shots when we need to. But for the most part, we'll keep the ball on the ground and we'll just take what the defense gives us that way. With a two-headed monster running back. 38-yard attempt on the way, and it is good. And how about Nick Smith? He is perfect 19 for 19 on extra points this year, and now perfect 5 for 5 in field goals. Have a special guest for you now, Jack Lingle, former head coach here at Marshall and a very special uh, man and, and a guest to have up here in the booth. You were actually the first head coach after the tragic plane crash back in 1970, really the guy who was a uh, big credit for bringing this program uh, back after that. Well, thank you. It's been a tremendous opportunity to do that, but uh, it was uh, something that uh, had to be done. And uh, someone said, well, why would you take the position? And I said, well, they needed someone to come down and help build the program. When I got here, I thought I was rebuilding the football program. I quickly found out that there were 27 boosters on that plane, four doctors and their wives, another doctor, state senator, city councilman, and uh, uh, the trainers, the managers, uh, the radio personnel. And uh, then they had 70 children without one parent, 18 without two parents. So it was more than a football team. It was a whole town that suffered the disaster. I was going to say, you really had to rebuild the community. Well, they, they had already started that process, and they were a tremendous help. The Big Green Club really uh, was the one with uh, the president, the interim president, who at that time, uh, uh, Dr. Dedman, made the decision in 48 hours to rebuild the program to honor the 75 people that were killed in the crash. And the townspeople were all behind that although there were some faculty members at the very beginning which I was not aware of that wanted them to drop football because in the past 23 years they had four winning seasons and then they had the uh, the scandal then they had the, the plate tragic plane crash so it uh, it was way down if, if so to speak in terms of bringing the program back but uh, we had walk-ons and we had people that uh, had never played football before three basketball players came out on their own with their fifth year of eligibility they all started for us so it was a tremendous rebuilding program, but we took it on as a team, and even though they were freshmen, we knew we could we could out-condition them, and we could out-stunt them, and uh, we would pass on uh, first down, we might even pass on fourth down, and we might punt on second down. You know, we did things that uh, uh, that were unexpected. They could not game plan us, and in fact, if you were on the, in the red zone on the right hash mark, and you ran to the wide side of the field, we put seven people in. If you ran to the left, you'd be running here today. <laughs> <laughs> so, Coach, what was your mindset, you know, just building their program up from the ground up? I mean, what were some of the other challenges that you guys faced? I think the biggest challenge we found that was to make sure that we treated them like players and that where they could position themselves. I didn't see them before spring practice, so I had to uh, put them in positions that I thought that they could play. And I always told every player that if you feel you're in the wrong position, come in to see me. And if, in fact, I could make a switch because you felt you'd be a better tackle than a tight end, fine. But if, if I needed a tight end and you were the best one there, I'd tell them you have to be there. Now, they could come back the third time, but that was a come-to-Jesus meeting, and I would make a decision, and you had to be where you had to play. And then where the tough times came in is when that freshman player became a senior letterman or a junior letterman after the third year. By that time, we're recruiting players that were better than they were in terms of experience. And so they were getting more reps, and the player would ask him, say, Coach, you know, I'm a three-year letterman. Why am I not getting the reps? And I would have to explain to him, you know, it's like a puzzle. Sometimes you're a little piece of the puzzle. Sometimes you're a big piece of the puzzle. But without all the pieces, we cannot make a team, and team is not spelled with an I. So as a result, some of the players accepted that, but sometimes they Time couldn't out. have broke your heart. 
Talking with Marshall. Jack Lingle, he it was the head first. coach here at Marshall University the year after the tragic plane crash in 1970, so he took over in 1971. Uh, so 36. many great players, obviously, over the years since then. Uh, one of them was honored today, Michael Payton, along with uh, many other quarterbacks that we've seen. Uh, Chase Litton on the field today should be a good one. What, were, what are your thoughts and memories on Michael Payton? Michael was a tremendous quarterback. You know, quarterback, uh, uh, he was one of the great quarterbacks here, along with uh, Chad Pennington, and uh, and we had many players that were outstanding. We had three Heisman Trophy candidates on Bobby Pruitt's team. Bobby took the program, as I always gave him credit for it. He's the one that took us to the pinnacle. Uh, from ashes to the top of the pinnacle, Bobby Pruitt came in and went 15-0. and And I always gave him credit that he was the one that took the program forward. There were other coaches like myself that put some of the pieces together and put it in a position, but Bobby was the one that took it and made it a national championship team and had a tremendous record. I think he won like 92% of his games here. And he's a tremendous coach and a tremendous person. And what he did before the premier, the premier came here at Huntington rather than go to uh, the, the gardens in, uh, in uh, Hollywood. And uh, as a result, Bobby took his national championship ring, which is the bottom of this ring, and he put our names on it, my name and Red Dawson, my two captains. And then he redesigned the top of the, the ring for the Young Thundering Herd. He wanted a ring that was symbolic to the beginning and the culmination of a national championship. And what a thoughtful coach he was. And there's only six of these rings, and that signifies the beginning with the Young Thundering Herd and then the bottom, the national championship. Wow. So Bobby Pruitt's the guy that put this together. Hey, Coach, how did you feel about Matthew McConaughey playing you as a coach? Well, as I tell everybody that saw the movie, my sideburns were never that long. I never had a five o'clock shadow, and I did not dress like Bozo the Clown. But Matthew is a tremendous guy, great actor, a little quirky at times, but uh, we exchange Christmas cards every year, so he's a, he's a good guy. I was on the set with him for about three months, three weeks. He's, uh, he's a little inexperienced. He, he throws off his back foot instead of stepping forward, and that's the ones that go in the ground. But he's a fine quarterback. He can throw from hash mark to hash mark. Mike Young played at the University of Illinois. Linebacker for the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, big time TV broadcast. <laughs> Trying to get there. Hang up with guys like you. Right. Ray Lowry, another carry on fourth down was short. And that'll turn it over to Marshall for first down. Yeah, Sean Petty with two straight big plays. Coming up from linebacker position. This focus on the center of your screen. You're going to see number nine just really stalk. Lowry all the way over, but then too, you know, not only for him, but for a lot of these guys that, you know, were seven redshirt or uh, seven true freshmen that played today this afternoon. Final play as Bentley airs it out, and it is intercepted by Marshall. Yeah. Coming up, pad the stats. They said knock it down. We said the Hail Mary play. But they can't I'm pad my stats and get an interception. Not when you're up by 20. You're going to try and intercept that one, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, you are going to pad the stats. I don't blame them. So the Marshall Thundering Herd improved to 4-1 and one to start this season as they win their conference USA opener 27-7.